now recording. Hello, welcome everybody to the July 2019 edition of the Consciousness Hour. Around about, it must have been six or seven years ago, I did a lecture uh, at uh, Devon, and it was for the Scientific Medical Network. And I was told that somebody that was turning up would be Professor Max Belmont. And I was delighted to um, discover that Max was actually in the audience that day. But it was quite comparatively recently when I was invited to an event at the, um, the House of Lords in London. And there were a group of people together discussing various issues. Funnily enough, actually, um, stimulated by a, a previous guest on this show anyway. Um, and Max and I just got chatting. Um, and it was wonderful because it had the opportunity for me to actually sort of suck the ideas out of this great mind that I'd read about so many times and so much material I'd read about him. But let's tell you a little bit about Max. Max is an emeritus professor of psychology at Goldsmiths. He's currently focusing on consciousness studies, which he's made extensive contributions through teaching, administration, and research. He's been a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Berkeley, 1984, a visiting professor at the Universities of Westminster and Plymouth, and National Visiting Professor for 2010-11 of the Indian Council for, of Philosophical Research, Government of India. His main book, Understanding Consciousness, was shortlisted for the British Psychological Society Book Prize in 2001 and 2002, and he's over 130 publications in this area. Over 100 of these are online at ResearchGate and Academia at EDU. He's on the Editorial Advisory Board of the Journal of Consciousness Studies, Psychology of Consciousness, Theory and Research, and the American Psychological Association, Phenomenology and Cognitive Sciences, uh, also Neuropsychoanalysis neuro, uh, and the Journey of Parapsychology. I'm also the proud owner of um, this book here, which is my main book, which is Understanding Consciousness. And as I was saying to Max just before, I've read this three times, and every time I find more in it. It's one of these kind of books that you take very, very slowly, and you take it almost paragraph at paragraph, because it builds up to the most incredible model of consciousness. And I think probably one of the most powerful arguments for consciousness I have read anywhere. Um, Max has pointed out to me that I have an earlier edition of this. I'm now going to be rushing out to try and acquire the later edition as well. So without further ado, Max, welcome to the Consciousness Hour. Well, thanks for having me, Tony. Great to be here. Okay, wonderful. So let's get into the nub of the matter, really. The first thing I'm interested in is, is what led you into your, your, your particular area of interest in terms of consciousness. What was it that stimulated you? to be interested in this from, from a young age, I guess. So what was it? It really was from a young age. So uh, um, one could call it both intellectual and existential. So I think I suffered a bad bout of the human condition, which, which sometimes is described as ontological insecurity. And there's a wonderful phrase that comes from uh, Ronnie Lang. Mm. And just, you know, a real absence of understanding of who I was and what the nature of reality was and um, uh, a feeling of insecurity associated with that and alienation and, and, and so on. And so um, I'm sure that's at the context. And then um, I was intrigued by kind of classic philosophical ideas. So I, I came across the idea of idealism that the world only exists in so far as you experience it to exist when I was about 14, and I thought, well, okay, if that's the truth, then it must be the case that the world behind me doesn't exist because I don't experience it to exist. And so I carried out my first experiment, which was to turn extremely quickly to see if I could catch it flickering into existence. So that was my first failed experiment. Um, but that kind of continued and, and uh, there was also that sense of incompleteness. So um, that sense of, is this all there is? So I remember being uh, in my college room, for example, at uh, Sydney University, where I was at the time. I wasn't born in Australia, but, but I happened to be educated there. And uh, just being surrounded by four bare walls and a bare light bulb and, and, and thinking, this can't be all there is. And, and but nevertheless being feeling kind of trapped, trapped in, in, in my sensory um, 
trapped, trapped by my senses in, in the totality of reality I could experience. And uh, at the time, uh, it was already known that other animals could experience other kinds of energies. Uh, and our own um, sensory apparatus was quite limited with respect to other animals in various domains. So, so in hearing, for example, our hearing goes up to 20 kilohertz and um, bats can go up to 200 kilohertz and many other animals can go much higher than we can. Dogs can uh, smell a rich, rich, rich world out there of, of, of variations and, and, and odors and uh, information bearing um, information, which, which we just don't know exists. And the same is true in vision, that, that some creatures can sense the infrared and other creatures can sense ultraviolet. So um, and I thought, well, what would happen if I could change the, the actual limits of my senses? And that became the topic for my PhD at London University, because I could think, uh, I'd done engineering before I did psychology and philosophy. And... Um, I could think of a way of, of extending my hearing to double the range of human hearing and um, by simply having a microphone that, that picked up signals twice the range that our ears can and uh, shifting the frequencies downwards into the, the hearing range that we have. Um, and that was a way of maybe exploring why our consciousness is where it is. But the uh, net effect of that was um, too simple for me to get a PhD out of it because the basic uh, uh, answer was the obvious one, which is the reason our conscious, uh, uh, our senses uh, are in the ranges that they, they are is because that's where the information of greatest use to human life tends to be. So that was a one-line PhD and was never going to get me one. So I then had to use that device for something else, like exploring. Um, I used it as a, as a means of um, uh, helping sensory neural deafness. And that became the actual formal PhD. But once I'd finished all that, I got back to the question of consciousness and um, whether there was any possibility of, of really adding anything to the, the knowledge which already existed about that. Did you find in those days that with the, the hangover of um, uh, the ideas of functionalism and the ideas of, of, of trying to make the social sciences far more scientific, that the areas you were moving into probably would have been profoundly disturbing to many of your associates and things? Or did you find that people were open to these ideas? Uh, well, uh, thinking Skinnerism and things like that, you know, that were very much... Uh, the, the truth is that um, when I started deciding to see if I could work in this area, uh, though it was basically ruled out of psychological research altogether. Now, functionalism in the sense that you're talking about it um, hadn't yet really become established, at least with any reference to consciousness. Right. Uh, so the beginning of functionalism in, in cognitive psychology did begin around about um, 1960 odd, you know, really it started taking off there. Um, but the beginnings of reference to consciousness um, in relationship to functionalist models really only started about 1970, something like that, mm. or 68, something like that. So uh, it was well known in the field that um, uh, focusing on consciousness was a great way not to have a decent academic career. And um, basically what I had to do in the early years was to pursue other areas of research as well, just to, in a way, you know, keep, keep the walls, you know, keep, keep the department happy, let's, let's put it that way. And, um, um, gradually, as I got into the area, I started teaching it. So, um, actually, the course I did at Goldsmiths was probably the first course on psychology of consciousness of the modern kind in the UK. Um, 
but then the, the British Psychological Society weren't um, really accepting that as an area yet. And so I was involved with others to actually create um, institutions which, which would uh, help to establish consciousness as a mainstream subject in the UK. Intriguing, isn't it? It's yeah. just quite curious, as, as they say, you know, the old ideas don't actually get in, the, the old ideas die with the scientists who believe in them, rather than through arguments and logic. And it's very, very sad, but it is refreshing these days that there seems to be evidence of changing. So moving on then, the billion dollar question that has to be asked here is, what exactly is consciousness? What do we mean when we use the term consciousness? Okay, the, the, I'm going to give you a short answer, and uh, the longer answer I would give for anyone interested watching would be that I have a paper on it, which is called um, How to Define Consciousness, hyphen, and How Not to Define Consciousness. And, and, and basically, what it argues is that uh, the reason it's so difficult to define is that most people uh, approach the definition from an already well-established theoretical vantage point. So if you're a functionist, for example, in your outlook, then, then almost automatically anyone trying to define consciousness working within that paradigm will actually define consciousness itself in functional terms. So, for instance, in the ability to respond in a novel way to um, a given situation, or in terms of the sorts of things we can do when we're conscious, of something as opposed to not conscious of that thing or, or simply processing it in an unconscious fashion. Um, so because you set it up that way, uh, the definition tends to come out that way. Um, and, and so if you, for instance, if you, you define consciousness as one, take one common definition as the, the workings of a global workspace, you know, as in Bernard Barr's, you know, very popular theory, then you've already, because you've defined it that way, uh, then you can look at what the global workspace does within a functioning system, as opposed to what the more modular aspects of the system do. And you just say, well, all the special functions of the global workspace are the functions of consciousness, because you've defined it that way. So, so my work starts in a different place. Um, I actually want to say, look, if, if it, there are all sorts of problems with functionism, which we may or may not get back to. So for me, that, that doesn't work. Um, but, but, but the bottom line for me is that if you don't define consciousness in a way that um, directly points to living experience, then you've kind of missed it. So, so when you do, take a word that, 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 if you talk about any word and its definition, um, you, to put it in very simple terms, the, 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 the definition or the nature or the function of the word is to point in two directions. And one way it points is to the phenomena that you're labeling with the word. And that's the bit that I'm talking about there. It has to be your lived experience. And the second way that the, the word points is to how you then make sense of that which you're pointing to. So if you're trying to answer the question, what is consciousness? To begin with, you have to, if you like, make a distinction between the things you experience at any moment in time and the things you don't experience at that moment in time. So for you, all the things you experience at that moment in time are part of your consciousness and all the things that exist, which you don't experience at that moment in time, are not part of your consciousness. They may be pre-conscious, they may be unconscious, or they may be non-existent, but there may be a whole range of things which exist at that moment in time, which is not part of your experience. So at that moment, it's not part of your consciousness. So that, that's the content, if you like. And then when you say, well, what is it? Then what you're asking about is how does what you're pointing to relate to everything else that you know about. So you can ask, um, what's the relationship of what you're experiencing to what's going on in the brain? What's the uh, relationship of what you're experiencing to the nature of reality? What's uh, the relationship of what you're experiencing 
to all those other aspects of what you might call your own mind, which you're not experiencing in that moment in time. So that's the relationship between what is in consciousness or what is conscious and what is unconscious. And basically the answer to your question is an ongoing process of, 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 of deepening that network of understanding. And, and the deeper the, 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 the network grows and the greater your understanding grows of how what you actually experience fits into reality, your brain and body, your unconscious mind as well as your conscious mind, the closer you get to an answer to the question that you asked, which is, what is it? Hmm. Because that is intriguing, isn't it? Because we're, we're moving here into perception, semantics, the use of language, how language restricts our ability to describe experience in the way we experience it. And one of the things that over the years has intrigued me is the idea of how language seems to not just create our inner world or our own structures of the inner world, but how we perceive the external world. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded many years about the Sable Wolf hypothesis and the idea of how with Hopi children shape of objects depend upon and they see the world in a very different way. But what we're talking about here now is our inner experience of an external world that that may or may not be a proper one-to-one -one relationship between what my senses are giving me and what is external to the external world and indeed what i am within that process because i'm part of the process i'm, I'm part of the thing that's creating it in both ways and and this is then brings us to the, the wonderful question of you know how does consciousness itself relate to the brain and the physical world you know how what is what is the i the perceiver and the brain and the external phenomenological world of the external world. I know we're moving almost into idealism here, but nevertheless, you know, what is that relationship and how does consciousness relate to it all? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very great question, actually. And, and, and interestingly, that's the very first question that I started with. So, so I went through quite a period at the beginning when I thought, look, I'm really interested in consciousness. I've got a PhD and it would be lovely to see if I could work in this area. But I've got no idea that I've got anything to say about it. And so I spent maybe nine months thinking my way through, you know, what I seemed to me reasonable to say about it before starting to study and, 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 and see what everybody else had said. Um, but, but, but the place I started with was exactly the kind of question that you, you, you're just raising. And, and, and it had to do with my own presuppositions about how three things related to each other. Um, the external world on the one hand, um, my perceiving system and brain um, uh, as a second, you know, um, player in this, and um, my conscious experience of the external world mediated by my brain. And I thought, okay, the external world is out there in space. Um, um, here, my brain is, you know, sitting on top of my head here and, and, and my experiences, well, where, where are they? What are they? Where am I? Well, and then there were two basic positions that you could take about that question. One is to say, um, well, it's not really anywhere. This is the kind of Descartian, you know, um, raise cogitans, which has no extension or location in space. Um, you can't pinpoint it. Um, so maybe it's not anywhere. You might point at your head loosely, uh, but not really be pointing at something which is properly, you know, defined in terms of location and extension. The second basic position uh, which was far more common, certainly at the time that I was, um, um, uh, you know, working in the early days, was that it's basically something taking place in the brain. So you're still pointing, you know, at your head, but you would expect to find it in terms of neural activation of you know, neural states and so on. And then I thought, um, Neither of those two descriptions actually is describing what I'm experiencing. And I was literally walking down Bromley High Street in, in South London when it occurred to me that my own presuppositions about the relationships between these things was 
deeply wrong because it didn't describe what I was actually experiencing. And, and, and what I was actually experiencing is very easy to, to, to share because we're all in the same boat now. So I'm, you know, on this, you know, over here looking at this TV screen and your face is nodding away and my face is no doubt nodding away if you're watching me. So there's a face out there on a screen and the voice is seemingly coming from the direction of the face out there in the screen. And uh, so we've got a, a visual experience accompanied by an auditory experience. And um, um, that's it. So my visual experience in my case is of a Tony out there on the screen and I can see my hands waving about in space and I can hear my voice, not terribly well located, but it's somewhere around me, but for you it would be over by the screen somewhere. And actually if I look around me um, and talk about the physical world, you know, the conventional physical world that we're always taking, this is the world we're talking about when we're talking about physicalism. We're not yet talking about physics, we're talking about the, the world is perceived of objects, tables, chairs, streets, mountains, skies, they're all out there in space. And there is no other experience I'm having of the physical world in my head or in my brain. So, so this, is, this, is, this is completely, it's, it's a basic counter, if you like, in the whole uh, substratum of the debate. It's a basic piece supporting the whole dualist versus reductionist controversy, which, which isn't based on a reality. So, 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 and then thought, well, how do I make sense of that? You know, if I'm just being honest about the Tony I see, or, you know, all, describe all my visual experiences of Tony, or in your case, all your visual experiences of Max. You know, no theory, just description. And, and, and I'd have to say, okay, there's this little face nodding away on the screen out there, and that's it. Mm. How does it get there? Well, um, uh, you can use conventional science for most of it. You can say, all right, there is something out there on the screen, and light waves are being reflected off its surfaces, and these are uh, transmitted to my photoreceptors in my eyes, and the visual system is responding in the way that we understand it to respond and the brain is processing those signals and uh, uh, ultimately, presumably, the neural correlates of a, uh, you know, once pattern recognition has operated of a, of a, in my case, a Tony, but in your case, a Max, have formed in, in our brains. And as a result, I see a Tony out there in space and you see a Max out there in space. And, and what's interesting about that is there's, it's, it's a reflexive process so a stimulus starts out in space, um, arrives you know, at the body and brain, is processed by the brain, and is then is experienced back out in space, more or less where the stimulus actually originated. Now, that works at, at, at close distances quite well. So you know, through biological evolution, our, our brains no doubt have evolved in order to give us, if you like, a kind of model. It's a bit like a virtual reality, really, uh, and operates like a virtual reality, really, uh, in creating, if you like, a perceived world out in space based on information arriving at the sense organs of the brain. And the same projection process takes place in a virtual reality. But in the case of the virtual reality, there's, it's clearer that there's a, a projection process because you're no longer confusing it with what you take to be the actual reality out there, you know, because you know there isn't one. Nevertheless, you know, the better these, these systems get, the more it will seem as if there is a reality out there in the world, much as, as, as actual reality appears to us. Now, that's just step one. And, and that it's a very important step because once you say that, you have to go back to all the other questions that you would like to ask, which is, well, for a start, you, you mentioned idealism. You know, what do you, how are you going to make sense of idealism? 
because now, in a sense, um, it's true to say that the world is perceived out there requires me as a perceiving agent to see it in the way that I see it. You know, if another creature with a different visual system were placed in the same situation with the same energies coming in, so to speak, uh, but they had vision, the chances are their own visual systems would construct that reality in a way peculiar to that species and the same for all their other sense organs. So literally it would be the case that for each sense, sense a creature that would be a distinct physical reality, if you like. In other words, that reality is perceived. I'm not talking about the reality as described by physics at the moment. This is the phenomenal reality that we're talking about. So, um, but um, it could be obvious right from the start that if you buy that, you know, and I, I, see, I don't see how you can escape what I've just said, because I'm not, it's a theoretical. I'm actually giving a description of the phenomena, not yet theorizing about them. And um, but trying to describe the phenomena accurately, then physicalism is in deep trouble because what physicalism wants to kind of say is that what we think of as experience reduces to brain states, but the brain states themselves are. Um, aspects of the phenomenal world experienced by other observers, potentially, if you see what I mean. And, and there never was, there never was a, 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 an impossible separation between what we normally think of as the phenomenal physical world and conscious experience. It never existed because the phenomenal physical world is actually a part of what we normally experience. Yeah, absolutely. Because it was one of the third terms I've used in one of my previous books, and I used the term electromagnetic chauvinism, and the idea that we take external reality as being out there, and a one-to-one -one relationship between what is out there and what I'm perceiving. But of course, a moment's reflection will tell you that's not the case. And, of course, I'm reminded all the time of the work of Richard L. Gregory in this regard, in terms of how visual systems work. And there was a section in your book that I made a note of that I thought was very fascinating, was by, about Francis Crick, his, his take on finding problem. And as you say, there are only 17 distinct areas in the brain that create the visual system, and these are specially separated. There are even more now. But, but yeah, I mean, so it's even more. Could you just explain slightly? I, I talk about the, the binding problem a lot when I do my talks, but it'd just be interesting for you to just explain what we mean when we talk about the binding problem and why it is such yeah. a difficult problem for modern cognitive science to actually come to terms with it. Well, well, the binding problem has to do with the fact that in, in, in sensory experience, for example, um, the the, the say in visual perception that you get a, a, an initial stage of what you might call feature analysis so 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 um, uh, you might get edge detectors movement detectors uh, color detectors um, um, uh, shape detect shape detectors uh, and so on the, the, a whole range of specialized cells and and these uh, these specialized cells um, Located, you know, in in the visual system, but but they get activated at slightly different times, and they're actually located in different, you know, they're not in the same place. So so the burning problem, simply put, is how does all this information come together again? Because you know, when we actually have an experience, it looks coherent and 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 and, and organized. And we have no sense of the fact that what we we actually see has already been analysed, um, um, uh, recognised, pattern recognition has operated in some sort of way, and, and the synthesis process has also taken place in some sort of way. And but I, I wouldn't say that uh, you know there are various models of binding, and uh, you know for uh, you know one one you know popular one is that it has something to do with synchronous firing, for example. Mm. So, so, so that even though um, uh, some of these neural systems get activated at different 
times and uh, or slightly different times you know we're talking about milliseconds and so on um, um, and they're in different places nevertheless it's a bit like 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 everything starts vibrating together in phase mm. Mm. And, and and then if out of this complete pattern of incoherence um, a certain pattern of, of coherence starts dominating within the system then then you know it's a very attractive theory in many ways um, um, that gives you you know uh, an interesting potential correlate for the actual experience that you're having you okay. know or, or it's a bit like in in my book I, I sometimes talk about it in terms of um you know like you're, you're you're in a football crowd you know and people are talking all over the place and and uh, and, and there's nothing emerging, you know, just noise, if you like. But then they all start singing. And, and you know, it's, 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 it's the song that, 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 you know, and the rest gets dampened out, so to speak. And, and, and um, yeah, you know, that would be one, one analogy, I think, for, for that mm. kind of problem. I don't think it, 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 it's the kind of problem that I think, you know, is, it's, you know, it's what's sometimes called the easy problems. It's not easy in the sense of, you know, literally being easy, but it is a, a solvable problem, I think. And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is that, that um, one, yeah, one theory that you find about the function of consciousness, for example, is that it's consciousness that does the binding. And, mm -hmm. and that's not a theory that I can subscribe to because, uh, and, and this is a, it's a completely different issue that we can get into. Um, it's certainly what I entertained right at the beginning. In fact, it was something I entertained even before what I was talking about. You know, maybe it was something, you know, emerging from the brain that, that bound together, you know, the neural activities and so on. And, and, and uh, the reason it didn't make sense to me and still doesn't make sense to me is that um, as a conscious being, I'm not aware of having a brain or of any of the details of what's going on there. So the notion that <coughs> consciousness is consciously binding things together doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you know, it would have to be unconscious and conscious and consciousness doing something unconsciously, which is kind of a <laughs> contradiction in terms, if you like. And, and so I never went there, even though I thought, you know, I was attracted by it. And I actually thought it might be related to the brain's electromagnetic field as well. Um, uh, you know, I think there are interesting relationships of consciousness to the electromagnetic field, but that, that, that's not it. Mm. There was some interesting work um, that um, I'd come across a couple of years ago about the astroglial network and the idea that it is the glial cells that seem to communicate non-locally. So there is kind of a almost an EPR paradox taking place in the brain uh, of non-locality where the glial cells seem to communicate in that way rather than neuronal and neurochemical communications along the neurons and the synapses. And I thought that was quite intriguing. So it's sort of moving into holism, uh, which again, could be a solution. But as you say, it's Charles' easy problem rather than the hard problem of consciousness as to how consciousness comes about and, and, and comes out of what is effectively inanimate matter. Now, one of the things, when you were describing what you call your reflexive model, you would, you would say that an immediate image came to my mind when you were describing this. And I remember those wonderful diagrams you have in the book of the lady's head and the external world and how the processing works, is, is the way in which, like, I think it was a drawing that somebody was putting across about Descartes ideas the way in which the image is kind of projected out from the eyes. The eyes actually project outwards, which is effectively what you're saying in some ways. There's kind of a reflexiveness. I'd really like to know more about how, how you see that working because it's so smiling and it, it's so, I was nodding in total agreement when you were reading, when I was reading this, because I think, no, this makes sense. To me. But can you explain what you mean by, reflexiveness in, in more detail yeah sure um one thing to keep in mind which which is is kind of subtle is that what actually forms in consciousness is an entire being in the world view. 
So it isn't as if there's a phenomenal world out there independently. And, you know, um, um, that, that it was never out there independently. Basically, um, if I examine my experience now, um, I have, you know, a sense of being here where I am over here and of you being over there and so on. But I also have a sense of, of if you like, the whole thing. So, so there is another kind of way of looking at it, which says um, there's just this kind of field of consciousness that I experience within which, you know, I can make out certain distinctions. You know, there's the bit over here that I would identify with as me and the other bits over there, which I identify as you and, you know, other things out there in the world and so on. And so, uh, but, but the entire thing, if you like, is, is, is like a construction, yeah, to begin mm -hmm. with. Now, when you actually get into the processes of, you know, how did, how did the construction get to be as, as it is, then we have to start introducing other elements. So, so, in fact, which we haven't talked about, for instance, you, you mentioned idealism. You know, and I'm not an idealist in, 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 in the classical uh, Descartian sense. I'm an idealist about the, the existence of the phenomenal world, but not about the world itself or the thing itself or what you might call reality itself. I, it, in no way, as far as I'm concerned, does reality itself depend for its existence on my experiencing it to exist. Not at this level, at any rate, and, 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 and perhaps not at any level. Uh, this is a completely different discussion, you know, and I, I don't want to go down there. I want to stay with your question. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, looking at things in a little bit more deeply, we can say, all right, let's, let's assume that the world as described by physics is, is, is as good a model we've got at the moment of, you know, what the real world is like out there, or it's at least an alternative one, you know, which gives us a reference point other than the world as we experience it. And for many purposes, it's a, it's a very useful and deep, you know, description and, and reference point, even if even physics isn't complete. Um, then you'd say, all right, um, uh, we're surrounded by a sea of energy and information. And within that sea of energy and information, we are a particular, you know, collection of energy and information, you know, embodied beings and so on. And that prior to the operation of perception, um, you know, before, let's say, uh, you know, any conscious experience arises, you know, as a consequence of, you know, my being as a you know, particular collection of information and energy and, and my surrounds, which are, you know, a wider collection of information and energies, there's information exchange between these you know, I'm embedded in this sea of energy and information and, and I also am created in such a way that I can view it, that I have a conscious view of it. Now, now, how the actual projection process happens is something you can study in conventional ways and, and it is studied in psychology so, so, so that, that if you look at, you know, the various processes involved in spatial perception, for example, you know, what means, leads me to think that you're over there as opposed to, you know, further to the left or at a greater distance or, you know, what are the processes involved in, in, in me seeing you the size that you are as opposed to a bigger size or a smaller size? And, uh, and then, and, and to give you very simple examples, I mean, this is very old stuff in psychology that, um, uh, and in fact, this is a phenomenon, I think that was known to Descartes, that there's something called size constancy. So the, there's something really odd that goes on if you compare the physics of what goes on with the experience of what goes on. When, for instance, if you put your hand um, a foot away from your face, yeah, you could just try it, you know, put your hand a foot away from your face. And then you look at how big it is, and then you, you, you take it to two feet and you look at how big it is, yeah? And you find, okay, it's a little bit smaller as you move it to two feet as opposed to one foot, 
But we know from the laws of optics that the retinal projection is halved. Yeah. Yeah. But the size is hardly altered. Interesting. Yeah. And that's just one example of, 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 of an entire area of research which you know, has been of interest to psychology for quite a long time in terms of mechanisms. Yeah, it, it almost suggests, I'm reminded of, um, in one of my books, I discuss the, the effect that you have when somebody slams a car door in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a car park. And effectively, up to a certain point, I think it's 16 minutes, there's a concurrence between you seeing the door slammed and hearing it. But further away, you then see the disparity between the speed of light and the speed of sound. And there's a, there's, a, there's a change between them, they're not in order. And it suggests that the human brain in some way buffers information and then presents it to consciousness as it's buffered, which would explain things like the five phenomenon and various other things, which I always thought was really wonderful that Daniel Dennett used that in his consciousness, explained as a way of dissing external consciousness, whereas in fact, to me, it intrigued me even more about the idea of how consciousness buffers information. So it clearly seems that, as you're saying, it was that what our perceptions do in the external three-dimensional world is not what is really out there at all. And I think I've never heard of that one before, but I can see it. That it's absolutely so true, isn't it? You know, yeah, it I, I, yeah, I, I want to slightly, you know, modify that a little bit. So, yeah. so I'm not of the extreme view that our perceptions of the world are not, what's out there at all. Mm. Um, what I'm fully, you know, paid up to is that it doesn't give you a full description of what's out there. Yeah. And, and that there are many other ways of perceiving what's out there. And, and um, uh, remember that the place I started, you know, back as a teenager was the sense of being trapped by my senses and wondering, is this all there is? Um, yeah. I've no doubt that it isn't all there is. And, and in fact, conventional science, let alone any, you know, extraordinary experiences one might have, you know, make it clear that, that, that it isn't all there is. Nevertheless, um, um, you can go too far with that. So, so um, um, I have little doubt that um, my perception of what's out there is a sufficiently good representation of what's out there to work for ordinary human life. And that if it didn't work very well, then no doubt it wouldn't have evolved in the way that it did. So, so uh, you know, A, coming back to the idealism, realism thing, um, um, I believe there really is a world out there uh, that it really does have a structure, um, that it, that structure doesn't depend on our perceiving it, um, that um, how we perceive it does depend on us as well as it, and, and in that sense idealism is true, uh, but realism is also true of, you know, the, the, the existence of, of, of you know, the ground of being, if you like, or nature, or whatever you want to call it, you know, and it doesn't depend on us. And, and uh, just to underline the last little thing, one thing that always struck me, and it, it keeps striking me, you know, because I toy with idealism and realism, you know, quite a lot, is whenever I, I don't see something, I tend to whack my head against it. You know, so nature kind of impresses itself on me that, you know, don't get too, too caught up in, you know, oh, you know, we just change our perception and the world, the world won't change just mm. because we desire it to, you know, we need to find the grain of it and, yeah, and, and try and get, it's like a balancing act, really. It is, it's one of these things I find that the more I think about it, the more it becomes more difficult to understand. And I think I, all the time when we were talking about external space there, and I was thinking about, you know, the old uh, Mark ideas that there is, if there's not objects in space, external space does not exist, you know, and it needs the objects to be reference points within the spatial world, you know, to leave bits and everything else as well. And that was intriguing. And it then reminded me in your book, the section where you discuss about phantom limbs and the way in which our physicality seems to extend 
into the external world, even though we don't have the physicality anymore because we've lost a limb. I was wondering if you'd just touch upon that for a second, because that was a fascinating section. And I, I felt I wanted that to go on forever because it was so interesting. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, <clears throat> that, that, that um, example and, and, um, and a whole chapter, or a lot of that chapter, or, uh, and, and in fact, the very first paper that I wrote on consciousness, which is Consciousness Brain in the Physical World, um, back in 1990 in Philosophical Psychology, um, uh, really went through all the senses and, and um, talked about this uh, perceptual projection aspect of it. And, and, and um, um, obviously phantom limbs are a lovely example of perceptual projection. You know, you feel that there's a limb out there, even though you know there isn't. And, and, and um, that, that, that phantom hand can itch, you know, experience pain, uh, can seem to sweat. Um, so it's a real problem. And, and basically what's happening is there are modeling processes going on, creative, if you like, you know, you might call them virtual reality processes, but, but obviously when a virtual reality maps onto the actual reality, <coughs> it's reasonable to say that it, we can treat it as an actual reality for the purposes of ordinary mm -hmm. life. But, but that, that's where that goes. And so, so obviously all the, all the studies that, that um, relate to, you know, what are the neural mechanisms underlying phantom limbs? What are the, uh, but the same goes across the whole of the, the sensorium. So, so, uh, um, uh, many years ago, Von Beckische, who was interested in hearing, for example, was interested in the fact that um, um, vibrations at the, at the eardrums, once processed by the brain, normally can be experienced as sounds out in space. And then he thought, well, I wonder if I could apply vibrations to the forearms and create the same effect. And uh, he found that if you adjusted the frequencies of the vibrations to the forearms and the phases appropriately and intensities appropriately, you could experience the vibration as a vibration out in space. Yeah. So, yes. so yeah, and there, there, there are many, you know, there, again, it's a whole area of exploration. And, and um, my interest in it is, is simply to try and underline this, this, fact you know and i say the fact is of immense significance even though we treat it as you know why are you talking about that in fact i spent years you know talking to people and say well why are you so interested in that and the reason i was so interested in that is because once you really take that on board you have to change the whole conceptual apparatus to do with an understanding of consciousness and mm -hmm. um, and that in the book that you've got took me from chapter 6 to 12 to do, and in the later version from chapter 6 to chapter 14 to do. So it, it, so many questions then come up that you have to think, well, how am I going to make sense of this now? You know, if I start there, as opposed to where we normally start. And my experience all those years ago, when I went, um, you know, I went through nine months of thinking, this can't be right, you know, uh, it's so different. There must be something wrong with it. I'm going to come to a dead end. I'm going to fall off some conceptual cliff somewhere and so on. And I, I found as I was going through this process of saying, well, if, if, you know, I say that, what do I say about that? That I was kind of going around something that almost looked like a, a labyrinth. And then I finally got back to the beginning and I thought, well, you know, whether it's right or not, at least it's self con consistent. And then I thought, well, you know, somebody else has probably, you know, made it all out already if it, if it, you know, isn't ridiculous. And then I found no one had quite laid it out in the way that I'd mm. thought, because it was just an original, ex my own exploration. But I found lots of people had, you know, thought about bits and, and they'd gone in different directions, you know, at certain points than I had. And, and then that made it work. I thought, well, there's, there's work I can do because you know i had reasons for wanting to go and make my choice and at least i could argue for them and 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 try and make some sort of cont contribution by following that, that sort of procedure
Well, it's so important. Um, I mean, I find in my world that people turn around to me and say, why are you so preoccupied with these things? And I always say, because it's the most important thing. It's because all I actually know is that I'm something sensing something. And to me, my life is in order to try and understand as best I can exactly what it's meaning. Now, in terms of your book, I found it incredibly enlightening. As I said, it's one of the kind of books that you read. And once you read it, you think, my God, that was just incredible. And when we met, I mentioned that it reminded me slightly of the work of um, Eugene Halliday, who was a, a, a philosopher from the 1950s to the 1970s. But you take it that much further. You take it into these really intriguing areas. And I think what's wonderful about the book, there is all these wonderful bits of wow factor. You know, you read the book and you think, I didn't realize that. And I think that was make it, what makes a great book is a book that's not just dry, it's actually interesting and it reflects directly onto you. Which leads me on to where your structures work. And all the time when I was reading it, I was remind, reminded of Eastern philosophy and the way the concept of Maya and the concept of the collective illusion and everything else as well. What's your take on that? Do you think that's where you were moving to? I was also reminded in many ways of um, the work of David Bohm as well, you know, the idea of informa or information and Bohm and Hiley and everything else as well. So to finish off, could you give us a little bit of background to that and uh, your ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, finish off is amazing. We've hardly covered anything, but I'd love to finish on something like that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, no, part of my journey was to, to realize at the end that I was moving in an eastern direction. And it wasn't deliberate. I, I actually thought that I'm kind of saying things which look very much like, um, um, almost like an addendum to the Upanishads. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it really all had to do with this, this issue of reflexivity. So, so we come back to this, you know, where I was talking about, look, there's this sea of information. And, you know, I'm a particular collection of, you know, combination of bits and pieces and energies and, you know, whatever within that sea of information. Um, and so I'm a kind of product of this sea. I'm still embedded in the sea in, you know, deep relationship to it. And I'm in a, in a, uh, I'm, I'm configured in such a way that I have a view of it. So I'm part of it, embedded in it. And I have a view of it. And, and if one kind of thinks of the sea of information as, as, as a first pass, if you like, um, um, uh, of, of the nature of being, you know, the ground of being, then out of the ground of being emerge these individual, you know, points of focus, you know, which are kind of collections of, you know, uh, energies and information from that original ground of being, each of which has a unique view of the rest of both of itself and of the rest of, 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 of what is. And, and, and so we engage in a process whereby the universe, so to speak, observes itself. And, and it's a participatory process. Yeah, and that's reflexive monism. So it's almost like uh, John Archibald Wheeler in many ways, isn't it? Has, it? It, has, it has resemblances. And I'll, I'll, yeah, although, you know, there's a sub-debate there, you know, about exactly, you know, to what extent do you get it from it from bit and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, we haven't got time to go into that, but coming back to David Bohm, um, that's very, you know, there's something very powerful about saying there's something, you know, within what he would call the hollow movement, you know, a kind of integration, you know, deep down in the nature of being, shall we say, in the fabric of the, if you like, the physical universe, you can think of it as a psychophysical universe, as I find more, more attractive for all sorts of reasons, which we haven't had a chance to go into. And that, that, that part of our own process, if you like, uh, as, as sentient beings, um, you know, uh, back in that state of alienation, you know, where I found myself all those years ago, and, um, you know, wondering, you know, is this all there is, and, you know, I'm not connected to anything, and so on, actually realizing if you like, experiencing more of that kind of connection to the ground of being from which, which you know, which I'm still a part, but which, which doesn't look like that, but, but which, and, and, and there's the connection with Eastern philosophy and, you know, the processes, you know, yogic um, exploration and, 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 and so on, 
were, were you know, fundamental, you, you know, attainment of a mystical state would be, for example, to experience, if you like, that sense of connectedness and, 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 and um, integration. And, 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 and ultimately, uh, that leads to a feeling of being at home, mm. as opposed to being alienated. I was always thinking that you're, you're almost a kind of an antidote to existentialism. Because um, well, I remember... It's my own solution, you know, personal... You have, you, you, you've, you've actually sorted out the problem of nausea and then <laughs> so the problem and wandering around trying to do, write his, his thesis and things. Uh, all the time I was thinking, this, this is good. Uh, and the idea of, you know, that at a lower level, you know, there's the, the, the singular state of Brahman and we're all emanations of Brahman in some yeah. way. Yeah. And we are we are experiencing ourselves subjectively within within this, whatever this is. Uh, but to ultimately, we're all the same. And I'm reminded in many ways, have you ever heard of the monologue by um, Bill Hicks at all? He's an American comedian. I might have. I yeah, it's the one where it says it's the one where he turns around and he does a talk and he says, um, uh, "Breaking news: Young man in acid re on acid realizes that that everything is just vibration slowed down to to, to walking pace, and we are all one single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively." Now back to the weather with Bill. <laughs> um, it just it, it really sums up that kind of moment of realization that we are all we are one, but not one. And again, you know, there's this kind of, and I think that your work really does that so well. It gets it across in a great way, you know, and I know there's an awful lot of work being done now. I'm particularly interested in the work of a guy called Vlatko Vedrell, um, who's, oh, it's wonderful. He's, he's written yeah. a book on, on uh, information, but not like in the David Bohm thing. He actually does as information, taking Shannon's information, and the idea of, of information has physicality, and if it has physicality, it's ruled by the second law of thermodynamics, and if it is, what happens to information when you throw it into a black hole? And of course, the idea is it will be smeared along the event horizon of the black hole, yeah. and therefore, if the whole edge of the universe has got this information, is this a way of explaining that maybe this is some kind of holographic projection inwardly a two-dimensional holographic projection of a three-dimensional surface and there's an awful lot of science being done in this with one Melda Connor and uh, Craig Hogan and various other individuals so it's a very very exciting time I think for all of us now again we've run out of time and I find it absolutely because we haven't even begun to scratch the surface here and where we could take these ideas and um, just because we will have you on if you were happy to be on the show again in the future maybe next year i think we could expand a great deal so in terms of anybody who's interested in max Feldman's work where would you suggest they look and and start reading up because really guys the, the, this is really important work uh and it's it's really the leading edge as far as i'm concerned so where, could, where can they where can they um find your stuff uh, I mean, the, the, the best single source is the second edition of Understanding Consciousness, uh, so uh, 2009. Um, but you can get a hell of a lot for free. So, so um, on uh, ResearchGate or Academia.edu, you get 100 papers or so, something like that. Um, I would start there. Um, and then just explore around and see, you know, pick a question. Uh, the, the thing that's nice about the book is is that that it it the first five chapters summarizes the state of play and 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 it really had such lovely comments, you know, by so many people about the book that it's a fair-minded mm. state of play. It, people, you know, from all quarters seem to think that was fair enough and and all the way through the, the the mainstream theories both their good parts and and you know what i thought was good about them what wasn't so good about them in my view and then it gradually takes you step by step in a different direction so if in order in, if you're really interested in making the journey then, then then the book is really the only place to to go i would i would totally agree with you you, you can get all sorts of stuff for free, yeah. But I would totally agree with you that it's the book that takes you on the journey 
uh, and it's the book that sets, sets up and it says, you know, what's eliminative materialism, what is what exactly the major arguments, what's solipsism and everything else as well. And I think as an introduction to some very deeply interesting ideas, it's absolutely perfect, I think, in terms of that. And uh, all I can do is congratulate you on a, a, an amazing piece of work and the accolades that have been put on it, I think are well-deserved. And I'm saying that in all honesty, I think it is an amazing piece of work. Really a lasting, lasting credit to you, I think. Right, okay, well, thank you very much, Max, for your time. It was lovely to spend some time with you, Tony. I enjoyed doing this, yeah. Yeah, and we must, we must meet up next time you're in London, because I feel I could just talk to you for hours. Okay, yeah, um, you know, if you want to do it again and explore something. Absolutely, without doubt we will. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for, for listening and or watching this. Uh, the next show uh, will be um, my friend, uh, Samantha Treasure, Samantha Constantine, who will be joining us. And, and Sam has had a series of extraordinary out-of-the-body experiences, but she actually analyzes them from an anthropological point of view, uh, not necessarily just the similar argument. Again, is the external world out there? Is the phenomenal world something external to us and internal to us? And can out-of-the-body experiences they're veritical and can be proven that somebody stands in a different location. What does that tell us about the true nature of reality? So that will be the theme of the next show. So again, thank you very much. And I uh, hope you can all join us again next month. And again, thank you very much for Dia Nunes in the background there, who beavers away and makes this happen every month. I just turn up on um, every month on a Sunday and do this, but Dia makes it all happen as always. And without our great guests, we, we couldn't do this show. So thanks, thanks, Max, and thanks for, every, thanks for everything. Okay. Bye. Bye.